All right. Hello, friends. Thank you for being here with me, Maisha T, uh, with our lunch series, Live Into the Work. This is a guided conversation where guests that I meet on the internet who have amazing causes get to share their work on how they're disrupting the status quo uh, to help dismantle systems of domination. This is going to be a very fun, casual, engaging conversation. And I'm super excited because I'm here today with my friend, my co-conspirator in this work, Candace Howe. Welcome, Candace. So great to be in this work with you. Well, thank you so much. I just so enjoy and admire all the work that you're doing. So I'm super happy to be here. Oh, you're welcome. Why don't you, Candace, tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Give us a background, who you are, what you do, and let's get into it. Yeah, awesome. So yes, my name is Candace Howes. I live in North Carolina. Um, I grew up in Ohio, Midwestern town, um, homeschooled. So shout out to black homeschoolers. Um, and I've been living in North Carolina since I was a teenager. Um, really kind of got started with um, writing as like a young person, um, activism when I was an undergraduate. Um, I kind of got inspired to start working with like social activism, um, anti-racism my first year in college, which is when um, the Trayvon Martin case happened. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I really was just like inspired to um, by my peers and kind of just different experiences I was having in the classroom, especially between like black and white peers to start kind of educating myself more on like black history, um, going to plantations and historical sites and just kind of doing a lot of work to understand more about race for myself as well as, you know, in relation to my own experiences. Um, in 2016, I did a uh, my first petition, which was in response to um, a bill that we passed in North Carolina that essentially just kind of sealed the footage of police body cams in case there was like police brutality. Um, so that was kind of my first petition. We got about 40,000 signatures and was able to at least take it to the state legislature. Um, and so kind of since then, I've been doing what I can in terms of essays and op-eds to work on different issues. And now I'm currently um, co-authoring a petition to address racial stereotypes in films, particularly with kids media. Um, but yeah, outside of that, I'm a writer. I'm a college access counselor. And yeah, I think that's the short version. <laughs> <laughs> That's really awesome. <laughs> um, I want to talk about the petition, but I want to ask the question, you just being like a college access coordinator, um, what challenges come up for just students who need access to college? There's a lot of challenges, um, particularly because the the group that I work with are African American high school students. Um, so they're coming from a lot of different, you know, geographic, socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, one is that we do have a lot of first generation students. So sometimes it's just like a challenge for them to even have people in their support groups who have had the experience of going to college. Um, financially, um, there's always obviously a challenge of just affording college, knowing where to look for scholarships, um, and then just having access to um, professionals in the fields that they're going into. Um, a lot of times our kids have such broad perspectives and they're really searching for careers in places that sometimes black people are not represented well. Yeah. Um, so a lot of times just like connecting them to people that can be mentors to them um, is like a huge challenge, but it's something that's really rewarding. That's really cool. Um, do you think just based on working with mostly black college students, do you see the way systemic racism is like playing out? in that whole process of college readiness? Yes, um, just because like something as, as small as like their, their in-school counselors, you know, kind of shifting them towards like certain types of schools that they feel they should go to um, or not allowing them to um, access people who might be at more elite colleges or telling them that, you know, they shouldn't have certain goals. Um, I can't tell you like, it's frustrating and heartbreaking, but like at least twice a week, I'll get a, a a letter from a child or at least like a read an essay where someone has kind of discouraged them because of the background that they're coming from or how they identify racially. Um, so I definitely see a lot of systemic issues from, you know, anything from jobs to where they live to how their um, their teachers are interacting with them in the school system. 
Wow. Oh my God. Well, there it is, guys. Um, as a writer, uh, I'm going to transition here. Um, you, you write about very a variety of issues, right? And so, what is as a writer? What are like some of your roadblocks or challenges when, when, and if you're writing about issues that address systemic racism or equity? I think something that's challenging to me is always. I feel that as a as a writer, as a black woman, as an activist, is all these different things that I'm constantly learning. Um, so a lot of times when I go to write about something, I always feel like really humbled by like all of the information that's already there. Um, and there's so many writers. Um, I think even James Baldwin said it best. He was like, you know, you think you've experienced something for the first time and you realize that, you know, these are things that have been talked about and, and dealt with for years. So I think a challenge for me is being able to feel confident in tackling an issue from my experience um, mm -hmm. and knowing that like that experience is valid, regardless of the fact that maybe someone's done like five thesis on this topic or something, but knowing right. that my specific voice and my perspective on this issue is just as engaging and just as educational as someone who might've studied it longer than I have. I love that approach. Your voice and your experience is just as important as someone with a familiar experience. I think that is what stops us from doing it, this work is that we forget yeah. that we we might not have like huge followers. We It's, it's not about the follower account, it's honoring our own voice and the work. Um, as a writer, I just, we have a, a lounge of members that we give them journal prompts, we give them assignments and they get stuck with like writing on issues on race. If mm -hmm. you could share like any tip for the co-conspirators out there watching, just how do, how do you push past writer's block? Like when you really wanna go deep? For me, I always start um, with my family. Um, and that's just because I, my family, whether it's extended family, immediate family, they've always, from the time that I was young, been very um, open with sharing their experiences with race. And so those discussions and those moments are very powerful for me. So whenever I kind of get stuck, um, I had a an essay that I wrote um, a couple of months ago for the Huffington Post, and I really wanted to write about everything that was going on, Black Lives Matter, the marches. Um, and it was really hard to approach it from like a high level because it felt so big. But yeah. a lot of times if I come back and I think about, you know, what's something that a relative has shared with me or something that I've been through and kind of talking through with that with myself, it always intersects and intertwines back with the larger issue. And it helps me to kind of like broaden that out. So I would just kind of encourage you to start small with something that, you know, you're passionate and you can talk about for like hours. And that's going to lead you back into the, the broader topic. Awesome. Love it. Thank you. So let's get into what I'm excited to talk about. I'm, I'm excited about you in general, but you have a petition yes. out in the world um, that challenges the Motion Picture Association of America to require mm -hmm. entertainment media to expand parental advisories to identify racist content. I'm gonna drop that here in the chat so folks can click and read it. Awesome. Why? What, like, what was your inspiration for this challenge? Um, so I have two like super amazing kind of like co-authors on this petition um, who really kind of brought this um, topic kind of like to my awareness and kind of um, made me look at it a little differently. So personally, I'm like a huge movie buff. Media like that is me. Um, and so kind of after um, my article this summer, um, I had a a uh, researcher who's one of our co-authors kind of reached out to me and say, you know, hey, she was like, you know, I was reading your work, you know, really inspired about anti-racism movement and kind of discovered that there is a huge, you know, catalog of films out there and especially geared towards children that are perpetuating racial stereotypes. And there's nothing that, you know, tells families, teachers, anyone to say like, flag and be like, hey, you know, be careful watching this, or this is a film that you should talk to your kids about. Like maybe, you know, The Lion King could be a really great introduction into understanding racial stereotypes and things. Um, so we've done like tons of research just probably over the last couple of months, um, just finding out 
all of the information um, that's been out there so far. And I think what's important is that young kids, you know, they come into the world and obviously they don't have racial hangups or concepts of like, who's better, who's worse. Um, but we pick all of these things up, not just from our environments, but also from the films that we watch. Um, you know, being able to see something where, even if it's a Disney film, where certain racial groups are being seen as, you know, less intelligent or um, less wealthy or more criminal, whatever the case may be, um, kids, you know, take those things in. By the time they're about three, four, five years old, they understand basic stereotypes. So I thought that it was something that was important, especially given um, kind of the explosion of anti-racism efforts that we're seeing this year, that, you know, we have to start at the beginning because as adults, we've all got a lot of work to do, you know, personally to unlearn certain things. But if you're thinking about the future, you want to start your children off in a better setting. And I think what we're watching every day is a good place to start. I want to make sure I can hear. Hold on one second. <laughs> okay. I don't know if that's me or You not. know what? I was muted. I'm Here we back. go. Okay. I was like, I hope I didn't touch you. <laughs> mm -mm. Nope. If they're watching, folks know that any type of a live, a workshop, they're like, okay, she's muted. All right. <laughs> and sometimes Brittany or someone will hold up a sign. I'm mute. <laughs> just go with no it. <laughs> I think I just got a text that said I'm mute. <laughs> that's me all day so hey if you don't hear me in two oh, minutes <laughs> right it's zoom. Zoom. guys it's zoom burnout leave me alone i'm just right. <laughs> um but this is real all right y'all so here's some numbers i want to read from the petition i did drop it in the comments mm -hmm. um by the time children are three they begin to recognize normal human variations yeah skin color but they don't assign value to them at four-year-old knows basic racial stereotypes. By the age seven, children develop racial permanency where they have recognized the body they are born in is the body they have. And by nine, as a part of their identity development, they become more aware of what place their cultural group holds in society. The one that, the two that are really sticking out to me all of them do, but like number, a four-year-old knows basic racial stereotypes. Yeah. That's and it's, fascinating. It's really fascinating. And I think it, it definitely kind of like took me aback the first time I saw it. And I think what's interesting about this data is that you have a lot of, you know, experiences and kind of anecdotal stories that back these things up, you know, from, you know, things kids see, you know, or say that someone told them in kindergarten, you know, like that's that age group. Um, and I think it's interesting because a lot of times you assume that maybe like a kid has like heard something personally and maybe they have heard something in their homes, but they've also heard and seen things in the media as well. Um, so to to understand like just how quickly, you know, by the time a kid, you know, gets on the school bus for the first time, they already have an idea of what kids are going to act like or what kind of kid they're around based on how they look. Um, so that I think really contextualizes just how early we have to start having these conversations and they're difficult. Um, and I know that's something you talk about all the time, which I think is important is, you know, being um, open enough to have those discomforting conversations because, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of times we think like, oh, my kid's 10 or 15 and I didn't want to have to talk to him about race yet. Um, but we actually need to be doing it a lot sooner than, you know, we think as, as parents or as family members. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I love that the, the goal that you guys also have set here, you and your collaborators on this doc, on this petition, um, because right now when something comes on TV, right, we just get like that rated M, mm -hmm. right? Or or I don't know the other numbers. Yeah. Um, but the MPMRC, Parents Music Resource Center, oh, that's something totally different. Yeah. So you're envisioning that the content will be described as as what specifically? Because I'm reading it, but I want the the watchers, the listeners yeah. to hear it from you guys. 
So what we really want to do is we want um, for media, so especially the MPAA, but as well as, you know, streaming sites as well, to orig to specifically say that, you know, this is an advisory when it comes to racial stereotyping. So um, something that we've seen, for example, when Disney kind of launched Disney Plus, they had like a standard one sentence statement that said, you know, these movies basically were made a long time ago. Some of this is outdated, you know, like it's cool, but we want to have something that's more centered on the fact that, you know, we're showing something in its original content. So we have not modified it. Um, this is coming from a time when we were not as aware um, or as strict about anti-racism efforts, but this does depict um, groups of people um, or cultural groups, religious groups, whatever the case might be in a way that's harmful and could have an effect on stereotyping and perspectives. Um, by doing that explicitly, um, not only in the home, but as well as in educational settings, it allows us to start to gain like more of a critical eye about what we're watching. So we're not just, you know, teaching kids to accept everything they see, but challenging them to think a little deeper about what they're actually viewing. Yeah, I love that. Thank you guys so much. Um, this has been super informative and super awesome. I think for those of you who are watching um, and you're, you're a parent, and specifically you have young children, you might wanna think about that as Candace is sharing, like what are you allowing your kids to watch on television? Is it culturally appropriate? Um, Candace, until the MPAA like kind of sees this petition and moves with it, do you have any suggestions um, just of what to look out for to make to see if something is racially inappropriate or insensitive? Definitely, so there is a lot of, um, there's a lot of uh, examples of um, different things that could be harmful. So if you're ever looking at a, especially like a children's film and you see certain characters who are um, coming from a different racial background than what we would see as like white or being mainstream and they are always the villains or they're always um, the person in the film who is being seen as kind of less than another figure. That's always a good example um, or a good time where you can kind of flag your child um, and have a conversation about them. Sometimes um, characters in a film who are seen as like the antagonists um, will have characteristics that we view as um, something that's related to a certain racial group. They might have um, black sense, as we like to say. Um, they may look or act like a certain, um, hopefully, I think we lost Maisha here. Hopefully she's come back. <laughs> um, but they may look like a, um, Ah, hopefully I didn't freeze. Um, I'm gonna wait until she comes back. Thank you and for your patience. My screen froze and I got kicked out. So thank y'all for staying here. All right, All right. we are back. <laughs> we are back in action. So Candace, <laughs> let's give us those action steps you were giving us what to look out for. Yes. Um, so yeah, if you're watching a film and you see that all of the um, antagonists in the film are starting to um, follow certain stereotypes that you would see, um, especially in minority communities, if the um, if the enemy in the film is having, you know, like a black sin or talking like, you know, stereotypically a black person would, or if they are showing um, a character who is from a different country, um, but they're coming with certain stereotypes, um, such as maybe like not having a certain level of education or not being able to do certain things, or maybe characters are um, explicitly talking about other characters based on the language that they are um, using or the religion that they are practicing. Um, anytime you see something like that, especially because as adults, we already kind of know certain stereotypes about different racial groups. If that's coming up, this is a great time to bring this up to your child and explain what a stereotype is or ask them what they think about it. Um, if you know someone maybe from that cultural background, you might say, hey, you know, does someone so act like this? And you might say no. And you can kind of start to tell and explain to them. Um, so those are things that you want to look out for, even if they're 
characters that are, you know, animals and they don't seem like they're representing people, but you see them as kind of having those same characteristics, that's a great time to kind of pause and have a conversation. Thank you. That was super actionable and super something that we can all do as parents, as a mom, uh, as a co-parent, always looking for ways to to really monitor what the kids are watching. I'm pretty sure that this also happens in video games. I mean, I hear some of the things that my kids say while they're playing Roblox. Yes. So it's it's, it's something to consider, something that has me like, hmm, this is some good information. I do need to take the things that my kids are doing, seeing and saying more seriously. Exactly. Thank you, Candace, for just sharing your work with us today and the importance of your petition. We've shared it in the comments. We'll share it a couple more times this week so that we can get to your goal signature. That goal signature was 2,500? Yes. Awesome, awesome. In the meantime, Candace, where can folks learn more about you and your work? Um, so you can uh, find me on Twitter as well as Instagram at aceisjoy. Um, and you can also find me online, Candice House, um, just like my name on the bottom, uh, .com. Um, so you can also contact me there. I have links to the petition there as well. I have a, um, I have a really cool kind of like media. It's an anti-racism media guide. So it has like films oh, wow. and, and books that you can watch with your kids. Um, and that's totally free to everyone who's watching. You just type in privilege. Um, and I'm going to post that on my site as well. And it's totally free. So that also gives you some cool movies and things that you can watch with your family too. Oh, that's awesome. Candace would love to have a copy of that. I'm going to get mine. So you guys know where to find it. The petition, the link is in the comments. You can learn more about Candace at her website, CandaceHouse.com. Also following her on her social media and sign the petition. Let's help her get to her 2,500 signatures because we do want the MPAA to take a stance and really change and identify culturally sensitive content for our families. Thanks, Candice, for being here. Well, thank you so much for having me, Aisha. This was and awesome. Before I let you go, you have to answer the question is, how do you live into the work of anti-racism? What does that mean? I think for me, it means, um, it means kind of following the path where, where your strengths and your interests kind of naturally intersect with like, solving a problem in the world. Um, you know, I think that we all have something that we're good at and we all have things that we care a lot about. Um, and there is a place for us to use those strengths to solve an issue that's going on and to kind of blend with a movement or an organization that's already happening. So I think that if we are tapping into those passions and we're living in a way that's intentional, um, it's going to lead us into the, the work that we're meant to do. You did. Yeah. That was amazing. <laughs> Damn, I caught myself. Um, thank you so much for sharing that insight with us and with our followers and our community. So thank you guys for watching live. Um, make sure that you guys continue to live on your journeys of anti-racism and we'll